Welcome to the Seahawkers Podcast with your host, Adam Emmert. Will you be my fan? Can you be our fans? Please be our fans. I want you to be our fans. I miss you. And Brandon Schultz. Remember the spirograph that we drew up earlier on the paper in the quarterback's room? Do your spirograph play. Go Hawks! This is episode 183 of the Seahawkers podcast. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers. And joining me, my good buddy Adam Emmert. Joining you on a frustrating week, Brandon. This is a frustrating week all the way around. Our Seahawks are, are frustrating. Santa Booth is frustrating. <laughs> Car problems are frustrating. I'll get into that later. I might do better. But uh, when I say, when we we say sometimes it's just really hard to get a show out every single week. Today's, th- this week's been a challenge for both of us, man. Like, I come all the way up to Kalispell to podcast with you, and you're in freaking California. Yeah. What's this about? Listen. I'm like mad you, at you. You abandoned me. And you're you're fine to be mad at me. Just recognize the fact that this is hard sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> occasionally, occasionally, you know, this, this is one where we're, we're we're making the extra effort. It's late at night while we're doing this. Yeah, um, at least for my ass. Yeah, and you've had and, some uh, late nights and early mornings, and yeah, yeah it's tough, yeah. man. The struggle's real. I, I can see this, you kind of have the raccoon eyes uh, that I see you have sometimes. <sighs> It, uh, it's not getting better the older I get. It's not getting better. I, I think I'm going to have to like go to the lady aisle and like, you know, find some like eye cream and stuff. Like it's, I think it's time. Yeah. I, I, we may have to track down a sponsor for that. That's all I'm saying because I mean, we are, there, there we go. We're, yeah. <laughs> we could use it. Yeah. Absolutely. But you know I, what? I don't I, want these raccoon eyes scaring the kids in the booth. You know what I mean? Like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we need to be here for our fellow 12s this week, especially after a pretty tough loss. We've got a lot of email to get to, and I want to get to it as a way to kind of explain just how I think a lot of us are frustrated this last week, get into the email, get to kind of where we're at in terms of the playoff picture. And I don't even need to say it, but I'm going to say it. Catfish! The freaking Rams. Well, yeah, catfish! They did lose for us, so thanks for that. That was helpful. Okay, well, I I tend to thank the Eagles. And they took out Carson Wentz. Yeah. Okay. So, are we, what are we taking a moratorium on catfish? The Rams on Rams Week or what? No, I'm just, I'm just saying maybe instead of catfish, the Rams is just cat the Rams or <laughs> fish the Rams. Like we could take half of it away. I don't know. I'm just saying, you know, they, okay. they helped us out last week. I'm really hoping they help us out this week too. Well, we'll get into that. And of course, our do better and better at life this week, maybe a little bit more abbreviated of a show uh, than usual weeks, but uh, we do want to get to everything. And let's start off with an email because I think we have to pass blame on somebody. And when the Seahawks lose, it's it's best to pass along blame to one of the listeners of the show. And so David and Florence yeah. this week taking the blame. David uh, writes in and says, I had to DVR this damn game. And of course they lose. Now 0-4 on DVR. I take full responsibility. I don't care if someone dies over the next few weeks. Their funeral better not be on a Sunday. I won't go. I'll take the divorce for staying home to watch football. Some things are just too important. And I'm glad. I'm glad David uh, took that on himself. Well, right. And, and of course, if somebody did die and their their funeral was on a Seahawks Sunday in the fourth quarter of the season, I would hope that that loved one who had passed would understand fully that David has to be there. No DVR. Like, like, Right. Like, I wouldn't want any of my friends and family to miss out on something like that in, in those uh, occasions. Like, I, w- I would understand fully. Come and, come and take a leak on my, gra- uh, on my grave later. <laughs> like, do that. Yeah. You don't need to do it on the day they put me down. The Seahawks fall to the Jags 30 to 24. They have an opportunity late in the game with the ball. And uh, I kind of agree with Earl Thomas after this week because losing to a subpar quarterback stings. You know, the most frustrating part of this game to me was Blake freaking Bortles because he did not make one mistake. He threw the ball into a bunch of tight windows. He made a bunch of plays. What, who is this guy? <laughs> this is it. This is not the guy. This is not the guy we've seen all season. Like, and suddenly Blake Bortles plays out of his mind against the Seahawks for like no reason. For like no reason. Okay. Is it? Bortles playing out of his mind, though, or was it the fact that there was no pressure on Bortles this entire game? Because, of course, he had his best game. He was barely touched. The Seahawks tried blitzing. They tried stunts. 
that was the most frustrating thing to me. And I don't know if you can say if it's the ineffectiveness of the defensive line that's part of it or if the Jaguars offensive line played their best game of the year. Had to have because they hadn't played well all season. And somehow, yeah, I, I agree with you. The lack of a pass rush was alarming. That was something I did not expect to have happen in this game. I really thought we'd get after Blake Bortles. Maybe missing Nas Jones is a, a bigger deal than maybe we think. I, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, certainly losing Bobby for pretty much the entirety of the second half yeah. uh, was a big part of that. Really, you saw the defense fall apart the second Bobby Wagner was gone. Yeah, 27 and points. That, they gave up three points to the Jaguars in the first half, 27 points in the second half. And the crazy thing was, is even giving up 30 points to the Jaguars, it still almost wasn't enough because the Seahawks had two opportunities late in the game. One with Russell Wilson with the ball. And we, I think as Seahawks fans, we all thought he was going to drive down the field and he was going to score. And then the second that they didn't, after Paul Richardson gets pulled down by the defender and uh, the, the ball turns over to the Jaguars, when it was third and 11, I think we all thought our defense was going to make the stop and give the offense another opportunity. Yeah, the give up on third 11, that was the most disappointing out of that sequence to me. Uh, I really thought that they were going to, you know, be able to to stop Fournette there. I mean, they ran it on third and 11 and Fournette yeah. gets it yeah. under the left side. And again, no Bobby. I mean, I think that's the biggest I think that's the biggest part of that. Or KJ. Let, let, let us not forget the value of KJ Wright, right. as we oh so often do. Now, the Paul Richardson non-call, while frustrating to a degree, I can totally see how the referees did not call that. I mean, they get a little tangled up and, and all that in the heat of the moment while you're watching a thousand things. Sure. I can see how you make that or not call, especially it looked a little you know, floppy the way you it went looked down a little floppy. It looked a little floppy. And then on top of that, you know, late in the game, I like it when officials want to try to stay away from making game altering calls at the end of the game. And I they think that, you know, a little though. bit of that. They should have made that call. You could, you could. Here's the thing: you can make that call, and you cannot make that call. And uh, at the end of the day, even though it went against my, our team in the in the boys I love, I can see how you cannot make that call. Well, so it I'm balances out about with it. some that, of the late game calls that we've gotten before, and you can easily say, "Well, you know what? On third and one, Posick, maybe don't get bull rushed and give up the sack on uh, second down when Doug Baldwin runs out of bounds when he maybe doesn't need to run out of bounds, and he kind of recognized that after the game, he could have gone." Yeah. He could have gone for the first down potentially. And even if he goes down inbounds, it's not the end of the world. So there are. And then, you know, you go back to the third. I can and see 11. where his mind was, though. I can see oh, where I his mind was though, yeah. at the time. I understand. Like, yeah. Yeah. But there's there's still other things where you can point out and say, had things gone a little bit differently, it, it doesn't get to that point. Right. You know, special teams giving up a huge return in the second oh half. Oh, my gosh. You know, setting them up the for defense the giving up like, a 75 yard touchdown to the Jaguars. So that was that was one of the first places that I truly noticed the difference of Bobby Wagner, because you look in that receiver was in the slot. And initially, mm-hmm. Will Hoyt was was on him. Bobby Wagner's replacement. I think he's supposed to carry him a little deeper. And yeah. Earl was looking to cover up for everybody, of course, and then just reacted super late. And that's that same route. That's that same route that the Eagles uh, torched us on once, could have torched us on twice. This is something that the the league has seen, and it's something that you're going to see the Rams run coming up here uh, next week as well. It's uh, it's also the same route that Doug Baldwin ran uh, for the touchdown early in the uh, second half. Yeah. So I think this is something that coaches cherry pick from everybody else, and I think this is one that every team in the league cherry pick this route concept. Well, one thing that Dave Bloomquist pointed out in this game. Well, really, as far as the Seahawks go in their history, the last time a Seahawks team won in Florida, it was 2006. Matt Hasselbeck against Tim Rattay. 23 to 7 win. The only Tim touch. Rattay. Tim Rattay. There's a, a name from the past. Wow. The way only, back machine. And the only touchdown for the Bucks was a Tim Rattay to Joey Galloway connection. I forgot Tim Rattay even played for the Bucks. <laughs> like, I remember him as a Niner. Just yet another reason for me to hate Florida. Pythons, <laughs> nightclubs, and the highest point in Florida is a trash heap, and the Seahawks can't win there. Yeah. Oh, and humidity. Can I add that, too? You can add that. Freaking Florida. They can't seem to get elections figured out. Like, they have problems in elections every year. Every time. Like, it's just, yeah, it's just like, you know, vote, count. Like, I, I mean, I'm no rocket surgeon, but, like, vote and then count them and then figure it out. But, nope, I don't know. It's a struggle. 
David and Camus emailed in says, I just finished watching the game and I'm livid. I'm catfish embarrassed by the lack of class the team displayed at the end of the game. You get beat on the field. Suck it up. Take the loss like a man. Shake hands and do better next week. Throw in a hissy fit, getting ejected and likely earning a one game suspension for what? Because your feelings got hurt. Grow the catfish up. This team is riddled with injuries right now. We need all hands on deck as we fight not only for the NFC West, but simply to keep our hopes of making it to the playoffs. Play with passion. Don't be stupid. Rule number one, put the team first. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, he, he hits a nail on the head with rule number one there, no doubt. Now, one thing, it's just in the team's defense a little bit. One thing that struck me throughout this game is that this Jacksonville team reminds me so much of the first year that Pete Carroll was with the Seahawks mm. and with Tavares Jackson at quarterback, a bunch of really young braggadocious guys talking all sorts of smack who are fast, physical. They're out there just smacking people around and, you know, with a very good running game and a quarterback that's mediocre at best. And at the end of the day, I think that really got under the Seahawks skin, watching a mirror of their former selves mm. being flipped on them. I mean, I, I'm sure in the back of their minds, they're like, you've been good for a whole three quarters of one season. Like, pipe down. Pipe down. Yeah. Well, oh, I want to see these hombres again. I know we won't see them again for another couple of years, but I want to see them again. I really do. They really got under my skin as well. And then in Quentin Jefferson's defense, just to a degree, I'm not fully defending him because what he did, like, you can't be doing that stuff. You're, you're not run our test. Right. You can't be going to the stands. It's in the mouse and the palace, but beers are thrown at him. Stuff's being thrown at him. Uh, apparently, uh, there was some racial slurs uh, being thrown his way and all that. You can't be doing all that. And it's because Jacksonville fans uh, don't have any clue how to win. They haven't, they haven't won anything since Mark Brunel's been there. Yeah. They have no idea. They have, they have it's winning amnesia. They don't know how to deal with it. That was the thing. It's like the throwing stuff at him. It's like, you just won. Right. Like, really? <laughs> okay. Fortunately, no suspensions came out of it for the Seahawks. And we learned that early this week. I know David sent that in essentially right after he saw the game. So, uh, but now I think the Seahawks are a little bit fortunate that they don't have any suspensions to deal with. Well, thank goodness the league didn't want to get in the way of a huge divisional game coming up the next week. I think that went heavily into the thought process. Well, getting back to the game, Kevin Moore, he writes in and says, After reflection, I think a majority of the blame has to go to Russell Wilson. The interceptions were more Hail Mary style than a good-looking bomb. He seemed very off most of the game. And I, I saw you kind of cock your head to the side a little bit, Adam, and I, I kind of agree with this, too. I, I thought the, the pick by Ramsey on the throw to Doug Baldwin, that pick by him in the end zone was... a. a a good move by him. You, know, you saw Ramsey kind of give a little bit of hesitation, which kind of gave a shoulder bump to Doug to create that little bit of separation. And up he goes and gets it. I, I just thought that was you know, for considering how young of a player he is. I thought that was more of a veteran type move. And oh, you're giving him way too much credit on that interception. Oh, so out so? of the three. Yeah, that was the first one in. If you, if you go back and rewatch Doug Baldwin towards the end of that play gets his feet tangled up with the turf monster and goes to the ground. Like if Doug Baldwin doesn't lose his feet there, he fights for that ball. I see. And I thought it was more the hesitation by Ramsey that, that, that caused Baldwin to go down like that. Oh, he, he totally tripped it. Like he hits his toe on the turf and then uh, like starts to, you and know, the impressive the interception was Boye covering Jimmy Graham, I think trailing him just a little that bit. Was, and that jumping was, in front that of him. was the least impressive to me, like out of all of them, because Russell Wilson flat under threw it. And either he throws it higher and further out or he throws it way closer. So Jimmy, as he has separation, comes back to the ball and leads him away from the defender. Like that was literally the one spot he couldn't put it. He put it in no man's land for Jimmy. So that leaves what the other boy, a interception on Baldwin, right on the left side. Is that the was that the third one? Yep. Poor throw. Just is just too far. Yeah. But Russell's going to do that, man. Like, how many times do we praise Russell when he throws up all those jump balls and our dudes come down with it? We do it all the time. Right. So, I mean, you're going to you're going to live by the sword and die by the sword. And more often than not, we live by it. And to me, I, I again, Russell was the guy who really kept us in the game. I guess if I'm pointing out blame, I say 
blame the defensive line of the Seahawks or, or give credit to the Jaguars offensive line. When we mentioned the non-call on P. Rich, we um, extremely tentative play by the Seahawks in the first half. And to me, that was expected just knowing the opponent and the defense that you're going up against that they were, they were likely going to be tentative. I mean, you look at the field, the way they were playing at the end of the, at the end of the first half, the end of the second quarter, when they're going for the field goal, I knew as soon as they were in range, man, that they were just going to run the ball or try and dink and dunk. And then what do they do? Blair Walsh ends up missing another 39 yarder. I, I'll tell you straight up. I'm not mad at the tactics there because how many times have we killed the Seahawks coaching staff <laughs> right. at the end of a first half for getting too cute at the end of a first half and having a turnover or just the, having the, the clock run out on right. them? They just take the damn points. And so what do they do? They go out there and they just try to take the damn points. Now, Blair Walsh misses the field goal. Right. And look, here's the thing with Blair Walsh. I know a lot of people are super freaked out about him. Here's the thing about Blair Walsh. He's not a terrible kicker. He, he made another one in that game. He made all his extra points. He's not a terrible kicker. But he's not a great kicker either. Right. He's a so-so kicker. And so you're going to have a few of those. And that's the gamble that this team took when they let Stephen Hausch can go and signed Eddie Lacy to a contract for no damn reason. And we've seen it cost the team games because not only was there that miss kick, there was another kick that they didn't go for when it would have been a 55 yarder. And there you have right. it. You, he, you, there's two kicks that Hauschka and, and you can't say that he would have made the, the 55 yarder because no. at any distance, you know, 55, it's, it's kind a of a 50, kick. 50 kick anyway. But Hausch money's good from 50, 50 plus. He, he has, has been, been this year. Yeah. You look at that and you say this, this could have been another game where potentially Blair Walsh cost you the game and that decision <sighs> in the offseason. You still can't convince me that Blair Walsh is a better kicker than Dan Carpenter. And Dan Carpenter, as far as I know, is still out there. He's the next best one. I would put my money on Montana Grizzly alum, Dan Carpenter. <laughs> I would. And maybe my homer's showing. You still have the team dynamic of him kicking Richard Sherman uh, on, a, on a field goal attempt. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> Eric from Anchorage writes in, says, again, we lose a game we should have won, but we shot ourselves in the foot. I may be exaggerating, but I'm starting to be ashamed of this team. After that game, I can say there shouldn't be any more talk of Russell Wilson as the MVP. I say we stop trying to win a Super Bowl because it's not going to happen. We can't win in the playoffs when we're on the road. I say we try to lose every single game left the season and we get a good draft pick. Eric, Eric, look, dude, I'm worried for you, my friend. I know the days in Alaska are getting super short right now. There's not a lot of daylight, and that gets real sad. It's going to be okay, man. This isn't, it's not that desperate. It's not that desperate. I truly believe in my heart of hearts, this team makes the playoffs. Now, where it goes from there, who the hell knows? I mean, it's, it's a wide open race this year. Yeah. It could be just about anybody. But with that said, um, you know, the conversation for Russell for MVP, um, you know, I, I, I've been saying that I didn't think that uh, he was going to get a serious uh, nod for that anyways at the end of the day. Like, I don't think I don't think there's really a chance for him to win it other than to win out. They end up losing that game. Russell didn't play terrible. I mean, you think about it. I mean, he took him back in the end of that game. The offense went from scoring a whole lot of zeros in the first half to throwing up 24 points in the second half. Russell Wilson's still a damn good quarterback. And uh, I'll put I'll put my fate in his hands uh, for these next three weeks and see where the cards lay. I'll do it. I'm ready. I think that email came in, too, before we saw Tom Brady go out and lose to the Dolphins on Monday night. So there's your front runner as MVP. Carson Wentz gets injured and now is out with an ACL tear for the rest of the season. It's down to Russell Wilson and Tom Brady, I feel like. And who knows what can happen over these next three games? Excellent point. I hadn't thought about in those terms. I think Tom with who Tom is like the Genghis is going to Genghis Tom is winning them. Oh, he's going to get it because the votes with him being 40 and what he's been able to do. I, I saw that he broke Warren Moon's record of most passing yards over 40. So he's he's going to get it. And he gets more action from the media than he does Giselle. I'm pretty <laughs> certain about this. Every time, and you know this bothers me, Adam, because you tend to lean along these lines more than I do. The idea of losing games to get draft picks, because go back to 2010 when Seattle was seven and nine. I, I don't know who they could have drafted in 2011 had they actually lost that game to the Rams in week 17. But the first week of the playoffs, we get the beast quake. We get an incredible win over the New Orleans Saints, the world champion Saints. 
And then the following week, we nearly go to the Bears. We only lose that game to the Bears by nine points. The Seahawks could have gone in and beat the Bears as the four seed. I think we could have had the NFC Championship in Seattle that year as a seven and nine team. So if we have the chance to go to the playoffs, I I want the chance at a Super Bowl. Yes. Now, can Seattle win a Super Bowl without, you know, if Bobby is out for a significant period of time, if KJ is out for a significant time with already losing Cam and Sherman? Eh, I I have my doubts, but we have Russell Catfish and Wilson. So uh, you said that I, I subscribe to this theory more so maybe than you do. See, the 2010 season uh, made me learn my lesson. <laughs> I, I, I know I'm totally on board with you, man. I was 100% wrong, 0% right. I'm wrong, 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 wrong about that. I flipped my position completely. Okay. When we get to talking about the Rams a little bit, I want to touch more on uh, Bobby and KJ, but um, you're right about the idea that uh, coming down the stretch, uh, call the MASH unit because uh, this is the most injured uh, this iteration of the Seahawks has been since Pete Carroll has been there coming down the stretch, and it is alarming, and uh, it, it's going to be difficult in that regard. Yeah, and just looking back at the 2011 draft just to give people an idea of who went between the St. Louis Rams at number 14 and the Seahawks and who they picked. Robert Quinn is who the Rams got. Mike Pouncey went after him. Ryan Kerrigan went to the Skins. You have Nate Solder, the Patriots, he would have been all right. Uh the first like three or four you rattled off are all difference makers. Yeah, they are. But you don't know that. <laughs> but whatever. I got a beastquake memory. Yeah. Exactly. And And a Super Bowl ring. And the Bengals got Andy Dalton. So there you go. (laughs) Which I will admit straight up back then. I think my biggest thing about uh, that draft and and trying to get that draft pick was for Andy Dalton. I really wanted Andy Dalton. When they took Carpenter instead of Dalton. Yep. Because, I mean, think of how long we'd been quarterback starved, man. Like Um, I was like. Really, we hadn't. I mean, Matt Hasselbeck was just getting to the end of his career. Yeah, I know. But look, so, so Matt was really, really good for you know, a handful of years. Right. But I never put Matt in the great category. Like he was always ninth, 10th best in the league in his best years. Maybe one year he was like a top five quarterback, but sure. he, like, you know, but he you was know, the best we'd had ever. This, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> so for her franchise that had really struggled in that uh, area over the course of its existence, I was really rooting for, uh, the, what are they? The horn frogs. Yeah. Uh, TCU. Uh, yeah. Uh, TCU. I was really rooting for uh, Andy Dalton at the time. Uh, thank God I was wrong. Again, this is a whole nother reason why I came around to your line of thinking. On this, but <laughs> Well, I think the last thing to mention as part of this Jags game or one of the last things Daniel in Post Falls mentioned this. All the people saying Michael Bennett was intentionally trying to end someone's career. I think he is just a man trying to disrupt a victory snap and give his team one more snap. What Jefferson did was classless. What Bennett did was football. All these people on Twitter calling him a thug ridiculous. Just search the trending Seahawks feed and look at what people are saying. Trolls are just sick of seeing us win every year and like to see us lose. Most of them are probably in their mom's basement feeling hangry because they didn't have dinner ready yet. For like the millionth time in a row, I completely agree with Daniel. Like uh, he's he's a freaking good dude, and uh, he's he always hits the nail on the head, man. Like that that that's a guy. Him and I are simpatico, no doubt. I do agree that. To the point of Bennett trying to swipe the snap. That is what he was doing. Now, after after the center stepped over him, he did roll up behind him. And I can understand in a way being a little bit upset, you know, just the disrespectful way of, of stepping over a dude. You know, they, people players tend to take issue with that. But Bennett's also a guy who has talked about in the past offensive linemen rolling up on him. And having that potential of ending his career. And I I do think Bennett was remorseful after the fact. At the same time, when you've taken that stance in the past, I don't think you can roll up on guys the way he did on Linder. When you've been rolled up on by a million offensive linemen and like, you know, you're in that moment. I can see how your mind would be like, well, screw this. You know how many times this happened to me? Yeah. Screw this. I don't even care no more. Like, I get it. I get it. I've changed my stance on a few things in life based on that kind of mentality. Like, ah, I tried this, this, and this to get what I want, doing it the quote unquote right way, mm-hmm. you know, and just be, and then being stabbed in the back and being like, you know what? Screw this. I'm, I'm playing for keeps. Again, I just go back to it's not good, though. I mean, it's I not understand. Good. And people are looking for a reason 
to not like Michael Bennett. And that gives more ammunition to that. The people that don't like Mike Bennett, do they really need any more? No, they, they don't. They seem they don't. to have the. <laughs> they have all they need. One more thing I want to touch about on the on, on the Jags game. Okay. <sighs> there is a phrase in my lexicon uh, that has now arrived that uh, comes out like you know pretty much every game, and it goes a lot like this: "Catfish, you a fetty." That's really it. Yeah. My goodness. Fetty was a little a little bit too amped up this last game. Gets a holding call and then a personal foul on top of it. He did get two hands to the face calls that I that helped extend drives. What? Because because he 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 got inside that dude's mind and like voodoo dolled him to put the hands to his face. I, I, I he didn't control him. He's not Geppetto. <laughs> like the other guy wasn't Pinocchio. Like you can't give him credit for that. The other guy was just being a a, a bad player. Yeah, I, I see how I cleaned up my language there. I was going to say something else. <laughs> <laughs> this final text came in says on to uh, next week where the spotlight player is going to be number 12. Lots of articles recently about how Sean McVay communicates with Goff with the headset and tells him everything he needs to know. Twelves need to shut that down. Whoever sent that text is a brilliant man, an amazing 12, and I expect that individual, whether it's a man or a woman, to lead that entire stadium in exactly that if you are going to be there. That is an excellent, excellent, excellent point. When does the clock in go out to the headset in, or to the, yeah, the headset in Jared Goff's helmet? 15 seconds? Is it 10 15 seconds? seconds? Yeah. I think it's 15. 15 is the one that stands out to me. So really making noise before that 15 second mark is the critical time. I have two schools of thoughts on this, right? With the, with the whole getting the play, uh, you know, getting the coach in your ear as you're up at the line of scrimmage thing. One is that's pretty smart because I mean, why not? Like, I mean, if you're allowed to do it, like you, you have know, the I mean, time, get up to the line advantage. early and yeah, if you can take advantage of it and they've been really good at taking advantage of it this year. Mm hmm. Yeah, my second school of thought is how weak sauce is that? <laughs> well, how, I mean, I mean like, what is Jared Goff? Like, do you let him ride his bike without training wheels yet, or do you just slap those on still? I can see Jared Goff going around L.A. on his beach cruiser with freaking training wheels on it still, with his little blonde hair and boyish looks. Totally, I can totally see that. It's still weak sauce. Like your quarterback should be able to go out there and do things. You know what Russell Wilson didn't need? He didn't need Daryl Bevel in his ear. To make stuff happen. Yeah, What's in year Darryl one or year him? two. What's Daryl Bevel going to tell him at that point? Hey, run around like a chicken with your head cut off and throw a dart. Remember the spirograph that we drew up earlier on the paper in the quarterback's room? Do your spirograph yeah. play. And Russ did a little too much of that in this game a little bit. He ran himself into trouble doing the double back thing. Yeah. Instead of running, just continuing on his path. That, that happened on two or three occasions. Well, I want to move on to this Rams game. I'm tired of talking about the Jags, dude. I'm past that. I am ready to get this win to sweep the Rams and get this team back in the driver's seat for this final playoff spot. Because I look around the league and there's things that are concerning me right now, Adam. It's concerning to me that Aaron Rodgers is coming back this week to the Packers. They didn't lose to the Browns, which it certainly looked like they were about to. That's on you. <laughs> Do not sit there with your little smug grin and act like that was on you. That was my risk pick that I was going to predict the Browns first win. They were up 14. Yeah. And you're like, oh, looks like the Browns are going to get the first win. Good job by you. And what did I text you back, you, Brandon? You said that I was certainly jinxing it. I know. I said, are you reverse jinxing me right yeah, now? Yeah, you did say that. <laughs> Yeah, because you were, and you did that to us. You yeah. did that to the team. And this now, is on you. And now Rodgers is back, and all they need to do is win three games. Uh, if they tie with the Seahawks, they have the tiebreaker. If the Falcons tie with the Seahawks, they have the tiebreaker. Uh, shoot, I think if the Lions have the tie with the Seahawks, they have the tiebreaker. So uh, Seattle is definitely in a bad spot when it comes to the last wild card position. Now they can take and, and the, the Cowboys are another team. If they beat the Seahawks week 16, they have the tiebreaker. So Seattle really is in the position now where they have to win the NFC West to be safe. Absolutely. To be safe. And that's, and that's why this game is like unbelievably gigantic as a 12. I'm going to tell you straight up. I am nervous as all get out about the Rams coming to Seattle with this much on the line. I've seen it too many times when that stupid team comes to Seattle and gives us fits. And the other thing that scares me 
bigger than life is the idea that we have no clue as of right now, Wednesday night of whatever freaking time it is. We don't know if Bobby Wagner is going to play, if KJ Wright's going to play. That that is really the this entire game boils down to me. If those two guys can play and play right, and I'm not certain that either one of those guys are going to do it, and that terrifies me. And the reason being, you go back to well, you just watch the Rams. And you watch how big of a role KJ Wright and Bobby Wagner played in shutting down Todd Gurley. You know, whether or not it's those those outside runs, whether or not it's the, the little swing passes to the screen passes. That's really one of Jared Goff's big moves is to dump it off to Todd Gurley out in the flat there. And if you don't have Bobby, you don't have KJ. That gives them one of their biggest weapons that they used against every other team this season. And then you're in a shootout. Against a team with a really strong defensive line. And a decent secondary. Right. I mean, they really do. Johnson a, a, is a decent player. Their, uh, their corner, uh, that or not the corner, but uh, Nickelback, who is a corner still. I, so just help me with my words here. <laughs> uh, the, the, the nickel corner. There we go. I there you together. go. The nickel corner. Yeah. That's what people uh, call it. I think it, it. It's something hyphen Coleman. But he's playing really well this year. Their left corner, not a great uh, uh, player. Safeties are, are, are decent. Um, their linebackers aren't the greatest, but with that defensive line, decent corners. You're playing in a shootout. Maybe you get behind. Well, not maybe. You probably will get behind because the offense doesn't want to play for a half. And then you got to try to put it all on Russell Wilson in the second half to pull something out of his butt. And that's really going to be the game plan. We need Bobby and KJ so badly right now without Cam Without Sherman, I've never been so nervous for a Seahawks season, like when it's hanging in the balance, than I have been right now. You talk about those two players, but then you also look at cornerback right now. And yeah, Shaq Griffin, thank goodness we got him in the draft this last year. But you're starting to look at Byron Maxwell as and wondering, you know, do you want Maxwell out there? Do you want Jeremy Lane out there? Does it really matter? Are you really wondering about Maxwell? Maxwell's played fine. He's he's had some good coverage. Did you not I see this I last think, game against Marquise Lee? I I don't know if he I, he caught everything. Yeah, did on you Maxwell. not see this last game against Marquise Lee? <laughs> he it caught was Marquise everything. Lee running. Yeah. Oh, sure, he caught it, but was he wide freaking open? No. No. Maxwell was right there with great coverage, and Bortles was throwing it into tight freaking windows. What do you want him to do? What do you, I mean, honestly, in a league where all the rules favor the offense in that situation, what it, what more is Byron Maxwell supposed to do? Uh, he's played great. People have been taking a giant dump on him, and that's really made me angry because I think he's come in and done an amazing job of playing a B minus B sort of level impersonation of Richard Sherman. Give him all the credit. We wouldn't even be talking about the playoffs if Byron Maxwell hadn't come back to the team. I promise you that. Justin Coleman's a good corner. Justin Coleman has been corner. incredible as well. Yeah. And and you look really with the secondary, uh, McDougal's done a fine job filling in after Cam. Hell yeah, man. Absolutely. But it is I, there's I really a huge can't... there's a huge difference between Bobby Wagner and uh, KJ Wright versus Michael Wilhoyt and Alexander. Garvin. Al- oh, Alexander Garvin's or in Garvin. there. Alexander's in there. Yeah, yeah. Wh- whichever dude they throw out there. Yeah, yeah. On one of the touchdowns, it was uh, it was Garvin that got turned around a little bit. And you look at the Rams, and it sounds like Robert Woods is going to be back for the Rams. He's been one of their top targets. Cooper Cup has been playing out. I mean, he's. I think he's now their leading receiver. And you have uh, and a dude who really wasn't a factor in the first game. But Sammy Watkins has kind of been coming on for the Rams. Yeah, absolutely, Sammy Watkins. But here's the thing. like The, the Rams offense isn't the thing that concerns me as far as their improvement or whoever's been coming on. They still, they're still they the same offense that we saw back when we played them in L.A. What, what concerns me a little bit more is the improvement of their defense under Wade Phillips. Yeah. Wade Phillips has, has done a good job of bringing this defense together. They're starting to understand the scheme. They're playing better. They play better on a rope. This defense is going to be an improved defense than the last time that we saw them. Without Bobby and KJ, man, I don't Are like they this really at all. that big of an improvement on defense? Because I watched the Eagles put up, what, 38, 39 points on that Rams defense in well, LA? I'm not saying they're like, 
I'm not saying they're massively better. Russell Wilson can still do things against them. I'm just saying that they're better than they were when we saw them the first time. Although they they did, ha- we're also better than when we saw them the first time and only put up 16 Absolutely. points. Absolutely, absolutely. In, in in some ways, it, it, I would put it this way: Mike Davis. I watched. I rewatched that game shortly before we got on here, and Mike Davis played a great game. I wish they would have given it to him more. You know, they did it well. Once you get down, right, twenty seven or yeah, twenty four ten, right, like right. It, yeah. it's tough. But but he actually looks really great. Uh, I'll eat all the crow on that. You know, I'm I'm stoked about that. Eddie Lacy was inactive. That made me really happy. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but Mike Davis in the running game had flashes, especially when they were running to the left. The pass protection is markedly better. And really, the Rams didn't get after Russell Wilson uh, a lot the first time around we saw him. And now the offensive line is better. So that that part of it does give you a little bit of optimism. And we're playing at home. And then there's that. Although that away game in L.A. wasn't exactly the most raucous uh, (laughs) away game that you could have. Please come to our games, please. I really want you to. Will you? Yeah. Will you be my fan? Can you be our fans? Please be our fans. (laughs) I want you to be our fans. I miss you. Don't be a Chargers fan. Be a Rams fan. Please. And we found out there was a little bit more to that this last week, too. And I'm going to get that. uh, I'm going to get into that a little bit later in the show. Oh, wonderful. This makes me happy. All right, Adam. Well, what do you say we move on to the second half of the show? Catfish! It's the Rams. Let's get this win, and let's put ourselves in the driver's seat for the NFC West. Catfish! The Rams. Let's go! Let's go! And we are back. As I always mention, be sure and check out Seahawkers.org. Go there if you want to be a part of the Seahawkers Booster Club. It is the official booster club of the Seattle Seahawks and great to be a part of. I'm I'm bummed that I missed out on our our get together this last week. But at the same time, uh, I don't know if uh, being out in public after a loss to the Jaguars would have been uh, good for me either. Oh, my goodness. So I watched uh, the first three quarters of that game on my phone as it was popped up, propped up against uh, the printer in the mall, like as I was making prints and, uh, you know, making little kids smile and like all that on Santa's lap. You know how hard it was to not just scream obscenities in the middle of the Kalispell Center Mall. (laughs) It was nearly impossible. It was nearly impossible. That was I will say I will say I would almost make myself better at life. (laughs) A little self serving. That was that was a yeoman's effort to uh, to go ahead and keep all that in check because that was hard. Well, the hard thing for me, it being in your position, would have been not watching that Buffalo game because <laughs> the game. I'm so uh, bummed I missed that. Oh, it was such a fascinating game because it took me back to those days of you in a Rams jersey trying to run a 40 yard dash in the snow because that's the exact height of the snow that the that the Bills players were playing in that game. I'm so bummed. I expected a phone call when I saw the weather report. I really did. I figured with my tape out there, like one of those two teams would be like, we need that guy. <laughs> we, we need Adam. We need Adam Emmert come out here and do uh, you know a 40 in the snow. Like we need we need that kind of snow speed. That's what we need right now. Yeah. And, and you had uh, that on tape I and they overlooked it, which is really unfortunate. I don't know. Some scouting departments need to do some do some better work there because I, I really feel like I showed out <laughs> like I, I do. There should have been more buzz around the league is all I'm getting at. Well, I know one of our members of the Ring of Honor uh, showed out this week when Becca used the phrase as good looking as a bag of testicles. I, I'm not sure I'll be adding that to one of my frequently used terms, but uh, I had a good appreciation for it. Uh, so me and Becca, uh, really get along well. Uh, and one of the things that we get along well with is turns of phrases like that. (laughs) That is something I'm going to use every day for life now. And I will try my best Becca to credit you every single time I can. Yeah. I, I had an appreciation for it. I, I'm just saying I may not use it, but I like it. (laughs) It's more my style. I get it. I understand. See, that's the perfect pitch that goes into if you want to be a part of our (laughs) Seahawkers podcast ring of honor, uh, you can check us out at get in the flock dot com. That'll take you to our Patreon page. A big shakeup in Patreon this last week. First, they said they were going to start charging patrons an extra fee 
when it's always been the the flat rate that you opt into. Obviously, Patreon it, it costs them money to put up a website, and so they they need to take Correct. a little portion to to keep that going. They were going to pass yeah, that ain't a charity. Yeah, they were going to pass part of those fees on to the patrons, which I disagreed heavily with. And I know there are a couple other people that were pretty upset about the idea that, you know, I, here I've I've made uh, an agreement to pay a certain amount. And now all of a sudden you're you're charging an additional fee on top of that. I disagreed with that. Fortunately, they heard the feedback. It sounds like they're not going to do that. Otherwise, I people can go to seahawkerspodcast.com slash support. And, and there are other ways to support us as well. But uh, uh, we've always appreciated what they've given us at, at gettingtheflock.com. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I found cool about that was the idea that uh, they listened to the feedback. But uh, the thing that I didn't find cool about that is they never asked us, the creators of content, if that's how we wanted the business model to go. Right. Like, hey, yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're going to charge your people more for like no reason and then like give it to you. How does that sound? I'd have been like, no, that sounds pretty dumb. And uh, fortunately, they, they figured that out. So uh, that's cool. So yes, get in the flock, people. Become a patron, uh, and if you don't, you risk not even being as good looking as a pair of testicles. <laughs> as a bag of testicles, you got to get it right. I'm put my own spin on it, dude. Okay, you don't 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 ruin my flair. <laughs> That's the remix version, huh? It is. Yep. Yeah. Waka waka. <laughs> yeah. That's the remix sound. In case you you didn't know. Well, I don't know if this is stepping on your do better this week, but I do believe it deserves mention that Malik McDowell, our second round draft pick this year, arrested, yeah. which was unfortunate. No, does not step on my do better at all. You couldn't step on my do better. There's no way you'd know how to. But uh, <laughs> yeah, as far as uh, Malik McDowell is concerned, the knucklehead factor is large. Like, good Lord, dude. Now, if I'm going to say one thing about this news story, right, is that. The good news that came out of this is that Malik McDowell is well enough to be going out and, and partying. Like, he's at least a person again, you know, after having his whole head caved in. And so whether or not that person's a good person at this point is is up in the air. But uh, if, I'm, if I'm trying to find silver linings. Okay. Uh, that seems like heavy optimism, and that's unlike you. So <laughs> yeah. I, will, uh, I will give you credit uh, yeah. for that. Okay, thanks. I was trying. Well, uh, I guess along those lines, maybe NFL Network will be a better place to work now that they've removed several knuckleheads uh, from from the airwaves, at least from the allegations really? that we heard this last week from uh, Heath Evans and Ike Taylor. And, no, way. no way. Yeah. Oh, I've missed all these. Oh, my gosh. Really? Marshall Falk was the third big name. No catfish way. Yeah. Yeah. Really? And, and the allegations are disturbing. Not cool. You know, pair that with what we heard from Warren Moon this last week. And uh, here it comes. I will say that out of the allegations, Warren Saps was probably the most minor. And had it been a singular uh, occurrence, I maybe even would have chuckled a little bit because uh, he was just uh, using the men's room. And maybe I could have seen it in a joking manner. But when you combine it with everything else, kudos to uh, the person who brought this all to light so i have no idea the stories and you talk you dance all around it like you usually do i have no idea so uh i guess that uh, is better for him i have no clue and for everybody else okay if for everybody else that may not have heard the story it sounds like it was i and and maybe i'm dancing around it because i don't fully have all the details as, uh, down exactly but it was oh, that's it, why it was either it's not because you don't like talking about controversial things because yeah. that's that's why i think no, I, i'm just trying it. to remember uh the the female's position oh, as okay. far as if she were it was a hairdresser or a stylist but she she definitely you know helped make up the guys before they went on the air and the things that they said to her directly, the, the things that they did to her physically through the allegation from, from what was alleged. I, you know what? If anybody's just interested, look it up. just look it up. Yeah. Look it up. Okay. All right. I'll have to look it up. Now I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, good Lord, people like just, just don't be, just don't be a dick. Catfish. Just be cool. Like you just, just treat women and like they're, they're like they're cool because they are cool. Like, can we just all be cool? Like just, just be cool. It's crazy to me. I don't know. I don't get it. Yeah. Maybe it, we could speed this whole process along and have every dude in America that like doesn't pull this kind of crap, like raise their hand and be like, no, not me. 
I, I don't I don't do that. And then we can just root this out like right fast because holy crap. Like I, I've been thinking I've been thinking for a while, Brandon, like there's the has like a lot of this has come out of the hashtag me too, right? Where women share their stories, right? Like I wanna I wanna create a companion hashtag out of support for all us guys. That, yes. We can band the, together it, it and, is, and let it's not out of defense. Yeah, it's not out of defense for for myself. It's out of yes, yeah, I see what happened to you, but not me. I'm not doing that. Right. Not me. Hashtag not hashtag me. Hashtag not me. Because if you if you if you use a dude hashtag me too like that that doesn't seem to work right like that doesn't work it's it's we we need something as our own as in support we do need something of our own although I I will say I mean in light of some of the things we've seen with Kevin Spacey the hashtag me too can can work for dudes too oh well yeah I didn't think about it in those terms but you're right okay but definitely uh, maybe in terms of solidarity for all of us uh, guys who. We want to know who our other fellow good dudes are. Yeah, jeez. It'd, ju- it'd just like, be good to you know. know. You, you thought you knew, but apparently we don't know. Well, and that's the big thing when it comes to a lot of the personalities in the media. You, you, I mean, we we really don't know any of these guys. No, no, we don't. In, in in a lot of ways, right? Like people listen to this are like, so here we are talking about this, but the majority of you don't know us either, right? You're taking our words for it. Like it's it's scary. It's a slippery slope that goes all the way down. But we're good dudes, I promise. <laughs> yeah, we're not we're, we're not pulling we're not pulling crap like that. I think part of that for me, I you know, I thought about putting this in my do better this week. To me, things like this go beyond do better. Oh, easily goes beyond do better. This goes this goes to like be a person. Yeah. It's just it's just basic. Well, with that in mind, let's get into the real do better this week. All right, who you got? My do better this week, and I kind of referred to it a little bit earlier with our Fellow NFC West rivals, the Los Angeles Rams, leading up to this game against the Eagles, we found, uh, well, and actually it was the Philly voice that found this casting call uh, seeking L.A. Rams fans, but not just L.A. Rams fans. No, it reads casting directors are now casting actors, models and talent to work on Sunday, December 10th in Los Angeles, California. Producers are seeking the following types. We're looking for LA's biggest NFL fans to be a part of NFL Sunday's Los Angeles Rams versus Philadelphia Eagles pregame show. Really? You're you're actually auditioning now, Rams fans? Like you you're calling out actors, models, and talent to show up to act as Rams fans, like actual fans you you can't be bothered or you can't find them. You need actors. To throw on a Rams jersey and come on down to be a part of your pregame show? Come on, Rams. If Fox is having to go to these types of, of distances to find people, they, they can't just go to a fan group and look for fans who want to show up for the pregame show. They have to put out it in casting calls. Now, maybe maybe I don't know the culture of L.A. and that just all L.A. Rams fans are subscribed to these casting call boards, and that's just how w- the word gets around in L.A. I don't know, but <laughs> if that's how it gets around, man, do better. Man, do better. Like That's like pay for cheer. You're like, pay for play? Pay for cheer. Paying that's for what cheer. they're asking for. They're starting to pay their fans. Well, and it wow. did come out that these aren't paid positions, so... I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. It's pathetic. That is the lowest of the low. It is pathetic. Have you have you ever like you know had to beg somebody to become a Seahawks fan? I don't think so. And not only that, the idea that you have to put it on a casting call board to show up for a pregame show. Oh God! Twelve's fight to get down towards uh, the uh, little booths that they put up at the end of the game, right where they got the analysts out there. They fight to get down to that front row and like you know yell Russell Wilson, <laughs> right? Like you know, yeah. Oh, you and that's on the, the road to too. Put on a casting call that's on it. the road. I I remember that I saw some of the most angry Seahawks fans that I've ever seen when we were in San Francisco for a Thursday night game, and all the Seahawks fans after the game went to to get into that area where uh, to be on TV to make the Russell Wilson chance. And the ushers at the end of the game would not allow people down in those sections unless they had a ticket to those sections. I saw Seahawks fans hopping the rails to go down there anyway. I saw people of Seahawks fans just uh, furious at ushers because it's after the game. Why are you stopping us from going down there and cheering on our team? Just stupid. It was the most angry I've ever seen Seahawks fans. And righteous. It was righteous anger. 
No doubt about it. Oh, just absolutely ridiculous. See, that's the difference right there, man. That's when the they difference. talk about the best fans in the world, like I'll throw our fan base up against anybody. And I'm sure there's some that give us a run for their money. I mean, maybe there's a soccer fan out there that's, uh, I mean, they shank people in the stands like, you know, like, so yeah. Yeah. Maybe we don't promote that kind of passion. Well, no, because we're like reasonable human beings. <laughs> but yes, it's, uh, a stark contrast between us and the Rams. We don't need Rams rules. We don't need casting calls. What a pathetic, pathetic catfish organization. No doubt. No doubt. Well, who you got, Adam? All right. My do better this week, Brandon, is for Adam Scott Emmert. That's right. <laughs> it's for me because I said a few podcasts ago, sometimes I do dumb things. And, uh, you know, not only do sometimes I do dumb things, but sometimes I am the dumbest catfish person to have ever walked this planet. And I do things that I just look at myself and if I could punch myself and I could punch myself, I think I probably should punch myself because it's just the stupidity level of some of the crap I pull is so high. And this is what happened to me just this morning. A couple of weeks back before I came up to Kalispell to start doing uh, Santa Claus pictures, I recently purchased a uh, diesel Jeep Liberty. I'm very excited about it. It's like a, it's like driving a tractor. Yeah. You know, with a little diesel. It's Brrr, nice. It's fun. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a great time. It's the newest car I've ever owned, an 06. I'm very excited about this. But uh, as far as Jeeps go, it's kind of wussy uh, in the <laughs> sense that it has zero clearance. Uh, like, And it has a lot of clearance compared to most cars. But for a Jeep, right. eh, it's, it's kind of weak sauce. Like, I, I'm not excited about it. So I bought a lift kit. Bought a lift kit for this Jeep. Uh, and you can only lift them so far, two and a half inches, because uh, it has independent front suspension. So I buy this lift kit. Everything comes in the mail. And I, before I come down here, I pull the car apart. And uh, as I pull the car apart, I start with the front end. And so I take off the front, uh, the driver's side front tire first. But before I jack it up, I loosen the lug nuts on both the driver's side and the passenger side, because I'm going to get to the passenger side, right? So as I start working on the driver's side, there's technical difficulties. I won't bore you with the details, but but it's difficult. I, I took the tire off the driver's side, right? And so for three days, I tried all sorts of MacGyver crap to try to make this stuff fit to, to, to lift this Jeep up. Totally out of answers. Couldn't figure it out. And I was like, screw it. Three days. Three days I spent without a car trying to, fi- trying to figure this out. So I put the whole thing back together and I start driving it. I've been driving it for like a week and a half, two weeks, something like that. Yeah. Right. Last night, I had to drive all the way back from Kalispell to Missoula, two and a half hours to pick up a, a computer because one of my computers died. I had to buy one off eBay. It's a long story. I have, but just trust me, I can't buy a new computer. I have to buy old computers to make all this work. They were supposed to deliver it to Kalispell, delivered it to Missoula. I was like, ah, oh, crap. So I drive all the way down to Missoula. This morning, I'm driving all the way back up to Kalispell to go ahead and do Santa pictures. I get about three quarters of the way to Polson and I hear clunk, 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 clunk on the, on the passenger side. It's like, yeah. Oh crap. What is this? Pull into a gas station. I think like a CV joint went out or the half axle is, is, is toast or whatever. Like, cause it was snowy. I had the four wheel drive on. I didn't know what's going on. So I started looking around. I can't quite figure it out. And then I look at the tire and I notice that four of the five lug bolts that hold the freaking tire on are sheared off. Oh my gosh. Only one bolt was holding the freaking tire on. You want to know why? Because I loosened the lug nuts on both sides when I started the project three days after putting, trying to put it all back together. Guess what? I forgot to tighten on the passenger side because I never got over there. <laughs> You've been I driving around lug- with four loose lug nuts. Five loose nut- lug nuts. Fortunately, one h- h- held on. And not only that, but the lug nuts go onto a bolt, right? Oh, my god! The bolts themselves had sheared off. And now I'm stuck in Polson trying to get up to Kalispell to open the Santa booth on time. I do dumb catfish things. That was so stupid. That was one of the... Uh, don't tighten the lug nuts. Are you freaking kidding me? And for that, Adam Scott Emmert, do better. Holy smokes. I can't believe you've, you drove that far. Over that many days. 
I drove back and forth to Calspot like 120 I miles a couple I remember you times. telling like, me about when town. you tried to to do the lift on your Jeep. That was that was a while ago, my friend. I'm such a dumbass, man. Like that is so dumb. I was so mad at myself for like at least a half a day. I'm still mad at myself. Obviously, I'm, 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 you can hear right now. Like it's just just stupid. Just stupid. When we tend to say goodbye to one another, you say drive crazy and take lots of chances. Uh, do, don't do not take that literally. Like uh, you're supposed to do the opposite <laughs> of drive crazy and take lots of chances. So what you're saying is that's supposed to be a sarcastic statement. It's supposed to be. And I feel like you're taking oh. it literally at this point. Well, I wasn't really driving crazy and I didn't even know I was taking chances. I was just being stupid, like just just, just dumb. Just take the wrench, tighten the nut. Don't die. That's it. It's really a very simple process. It's a very simple process. Just don't be an idiot. Anyways, I'm sorry. All right, let's move on to better at life. On to better at life. And uh, people who hopefully would be smart enough to to tighten the lug nuts on their tires when they loosen them. Good, good God, please. Yes. Uh, I'll stop trying to rub it in. I, I promise. Oh, you no, know, you can rub it in all you want. Everybody can rub it in. I want a thousand emails telling me what a freaking moron I am because I am. It's fine. I'm owning it. I'm wearing it. It is what it is. Yeah. Well, my better at life this week is for Stanford graduate and Seahawks wide receiver Doug Baldwin. Uh, in a press conference this last week, he announced his support for Initiative 940, uh, which it sounds like it already has bipartisan support. And it's for uh, additional training for police officers. And it's not necessarily the initiative uh, and the fact that he's I mean, this is something that he's been a proponent of for a while now. So what is Initiative 940? What What is it? It's what it is. It's uh, it's going to go on the ballot in Washington and it's going to require law enforcement to receive uh, violence, de-escalation, uh, mental health and first aid training for officers. And you know, this comes from the background of Doug Baldwin. You know, his father is a police officer, you know, ran for sheriff in Pensacola, and he was announcing his support and um, and how this uh, initiative is uh, set to go on the ballot, uh, providing financial support for it as well. But my my bigger point, Adam, was not just the the idea that he's put this together, but the idea that he's gone to the police officers in Washington to talk about this to directly to them about uh, just how much this means to him in particular and to understand where officers are coming from. Because one of the things that he explained in his in his press conference was he he sat down at dinner with SWAT officers and, I, and I, his father was a SWAT officer as well. But he wanted them to understand that this is not about being anti-police, but instead of being a, a police advocate. And one of the things that he explained that came out of this was how many of the officers there had maybe a perception of him that he that he was anti-police uh, and by him going and speaking to him directly, uh, giving them his background and the reason why he's doing a lot of part of this, you know, with with having his father, you know, a background in law enforcement and the type of training that he went through with violence de-escalation. And he said through those face to face conversations that he received, he felt as though he was receiving a lot more support for what he was trying to do. There's so many of us that would look at a situation like that and go, you know, I I really am passionate about this, but going to speak in that type of situation where maybe I, I feel as though I don't have the type of support might shy away from that. Not well received. Yeah, not well received is what you're thinking going in. Right. And and so you would think, you know what, that's probably going to be a difficult, difficult conversation to have. I may not want to put myself in that situation, but Doug Baldwin did it. You know, he it's an uncomfortable place to go when maybe you don't think you have the kind of support. And it ended up being a good thing for everybody from his side of the story that they had this perception of of Doug Baldwin. And it completely changed for some people who came up and, and spoke with him at the, that event. So for going outside of his comfort zone, for being passionate about a, a certain cause and doing something that probably went a long way to help his cause. Doug Baldwin, better at life than Skip Bayless. Not surprising out of him. Uh, a fearless guy. I can imagine uh, that uh, he doesn't shy away from anything. And a thoughtful man. And uh, 
what really strikes me about that is the idea that when you finally have face to face conversations with the people that uh, disagree with you passionately, right? Or or maybe think they do, and then they're like, "Oh no, wait!" Or you think you disagree with them even too, right? Right. And so you go and you have that face to face conversation rather than like some sort of Facebook uh, uh, rant towards one another or, or a Twitter battle or any of that other nonsense that social media seems to provide when it seems like you sit down face to face with somebody that has ide- uh, opposite ideals than you do somehow magically, because you know, we're people we can sit down and go, Oh, you're not the worst guy. Oh, I see where you're coming from a little bit. All right. Maybe I still disagree with you on a few things, but then you have a real conversation. It's freaking magic. It's magic. And so, so for for Doug Baldwin to do that, you're right. Better at life than Skip Bayless, no doubt. Well, who you got this week, Adam? All right, my better at life than Skip Bayless this week is for the Seahawks equipment manager, and that's right. I'm that big of a fanboy that I actually know who the Seahawks equipment manager is. I've seen him in interviews. I've seen him on little clips on Seahawks.com. I know this man. Well, I know him as a fan. I know Eric Peterson. I knew his name. And I recognize him straight out of the gate when I saw him at the end of the Jacksonville game. So Quentin Jefferson comes off the field. We talked about it earlier. Crap thrown at him. Slurs thrown at him. All that stuff. And he's going to climb in the stands and go full run our test on people. Screw up this whole freaking season. This is going to be a monster breakdown, right? And who's there to save the day? Nobody else except for equipment manager Eric Peterson, that is the man that you saw grabbing him by the back of the shoulder pads and pulling him off the rail. That was the man sitting there and telling that guy and telling Quentin Jefferson to calm down, that he loved him, that he understood what was going on, to calm him down and keep him out of the stance. Eric Peterson did an amazing freaking job in that situation, holding back a guy with that kind of power and strength when he was seeing nothing but red. Yeah. Seeing his chili was running so hot. And Eric Peterson had the wherewithal to save the team right there. Unfreaking believable presence of mind, courage, and a, a great thought process. I am I'm even a bigger fan now than I was before. And I, trust me, I was actually a fan of our equipment manager before <laughs> this. So Eric Peterson, you, my friend, are better at life than Skip Bayless. You know, I had a lot of butterflies in my stomach while watching that game, you know, throughout the game, especially when we were down and and, and close to being tied up. But I don't think I had quite the feeling in my stomach as I did when I saw Quentin Jefferson grab onto that railing and act as though he oh, was going to yeah. go into the crowd. Yeah. Uh, out of my mouth was, oh, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 yeah, right. no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 just all the no's. Yeah. Because of what happened when Ron Artest went into the stands in, in NBA. And gosh, I don't know when that was. It's has it been has it been almost 10 years now since that NBA game where he went to the stands to confront a fan? It was Reggie Miller's last season uh, with the Indiana Pacers. The uh, Indiana Pacers were playing the Detroit Pistons in Detroit. There was a, a fight between Ron Artest and Ben Wallace, the center then at the time for the for the Pistons. Um, the whole teams cleared the bench, everything. Ron Artest ended up laying down on the scorer's table and Reggie Miller trying to talk him off a cliff because Ron Artest has a little bit of crazy in him. A little bit. And uh, a little bit. And... Uh, or well, Meta World Peace, I guess is his name now. Oh, right. So uh, sorry to sorry to get the name incorrect, but uh, and then Reggie Miller tells the story hilariously. He says he watched the beer come down from the stands in that cup, and he was just thinking no as it came down, and when it hit Ron in the chest, it was on. Ron was in the stands. Steven Jackson was in the stands. The malice in the palace. If you haven't seen it, look it up. It, uh, now it's almost amusing. But at the time, you were like, holy crap. This is when fans and players crossed a gigantic line, both of them. Right. And uh, thank goodness for Eric Peterson for stopping the NFL version of that. And uh, he's a good man, a hell of an employee. What I can't understand is how there wasn't somebody from the coaching staff escorting uh, Quentin Jefferson out at that point. I don't know what the procedure is on that. I'm just glad Eric was there and uh, definitely important to recognize that. Thank goodness he was there. Oh, thank goodness, man. Well, and uh, catfish it's the Rams. Yeah, catfish the Rams. So uh, all rooting for a Seahawks victory next week. Uh, scary game. Let's get it. 
Let's go. Now's the time. This is it. Please, Bobby, play. <laughs> Just please, Bobby, play. We need you, Bobby. It sounds like he really wants to, but um, and please, KJ, play. Yes, yeah, send all of you the know. positive thoughts and prayers to Bobby Wagner's hamstring and to uh, KJ, KJ Wright's brain. brain. Yeah. Yes, because we need yes. both of those things healthy enough to play on Sunday. Send all your good hawker to those two players, and I think with that... There's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks! Go Hawks! I I just... If I... I, I, Catfits are... Leading up to this game against the Eagle... Leading up to this game against the Eagles. <laughs> the Eagles. That's the best slip of the tongue you've ever had. The Eagles. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's a soft J.